Howard Stern may think he's the king of all media, but I'm the British king of all media, and tonight, I'm the one asking the question. England is the size of Philadelphia. <laughs> I, I conquered Philadelphia in 1980. <laughs> I'm Howard Stern! <laughs> Piers Morgan Show. Starring Piers Morgan. Look at the butt cheeks on that chick. This is Piers' nightmare, not mine. I'm just here for fun. Howard Stern, how much of his private parts will he show you? You've got that certain je ne sais quoi. You've got it. You've got it. You're on a roll. Howard Stern. Now, when I first appeared on your show, yes. I remember being dragged into this sort of side dungeon, and one of your producers saying, OK, this is how this works. You either appear for five minutes, or an hour. It depends how interesting Howard thinks you are. I mean, talk about piling the pressure on. So today, same rule applies. First of all, be I have, good, or you're gone. First of all, I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> I'm looking at myself on the monitor, and I'm seeing that my hair looks awfully big today. But that's all right. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll deal with that. It's a pleasure to be here on your show. Thank you, Howard. I want to congratulate you on unseating a 95-year-old man. <laughs> good for you. Poor Larry King is sitting home right now pulling what few hairs he has in his head out. I mean, what a nut job. You leave Larry King alone. Do you like Larry? I love Larry King. And I was always amazed that, like, dignitaries, presidents, people who are important, <laughs> people who have security teams, would sit here with this maniac. I mean, Larry... Larry King's not a maniac. They should have had a reality Look, show with Larry King. You're my second show. I want to have a third show. Yes. All right? Listen, I like you. I like you on America's Got Talent. I think you're a terrific judge. I think you're a nice man. But who the hell knows what you're going to do on here? Uh, they tell me you're a journalist, but that's tell it. me you're a journalist. This is what they tell me. I was you're a, a journalist. journalist for 25 years. Okay, but people in America don't know that. Well, they do now. What is your background? Tell, tell, the, tell the world. Where well, were I'm you? I'm doing the interview, Howard. No, but, but here's it's my not point. your show. But Piers, I am in I charge. I want to see you be successful. <laughs> Listen, I wish you a lot of luck. But as I said to your people in there, I said, look, Piers was in England. To be successful in England is very nice. But England's the size of Philadelphia. <laughs> to conquer England, it takes about two days. Let me tell you something. You call yourself the king of all media. That's right. You don't even have kings in America. You're not oh. allowed to be a king. The name king of all media was a goof, obviously. <laughs> I didn't think I was the king of all media. I wanted to prove a point. It always struck me as fascinating that Michael Jackson decided to call himself the king of pop. And I said to myself, boy, that's unbelievable. It's, it's, it's obnoxious and pretentious. Who's going to buy into it that? It was also true. Well, after a while, everywhere he was introduced, he was then called <laughs> King of Pop. They didn't say he called himself King of Pop. The Rolling Stones called themselves the world's greatest rock and roll band. I happen to agree with that. But it's very pretentious to call yourself, call yourself that. So I said on the radio, I'm going to start. This is 20 years ago. I'm going to call myself King of Media. <laughs> and then... Um, Jackie Martley, who worked on my Showtime, said, no, you should be king of all media. <laughs> I said, okay. And then slowly but surely, it was a joke, but then slowly but surely, it started to become a name that was attributed yeah, to but me. You've never denied being the king of all media. No, I am the king of all you media. You can call it a goof, but actually, quietly, you believe it, don't the you? Reason You're I'm the, the highest paid figure in all media. The reason Doesn't I'm... that make you the king? Yeah. The reason I'm the king of all media is I am particularly good at being on the radio, being in broadcasting now my whole life. Whatever I say is interesting. I am a fascinating human being. That's not true. Out. Well, it is. That's no, not true. I'm just Everything some, I say no, is interesting. Like all people in your position, you're one of the best at it, but some days you're off your game. No, I don't you're think boring. so. Yeah, no, doesn't it? Piers, you can say that to be outrageous because you think you're different than Larry <laughs> King. They've all tried it. <laughs> you know, I heard a rumor that you were going to challenge me today. You wanted to be confrontational. You wanted to say that you are the best interviewer in the world and all I that. Am. And that's good. I'm glad you're confident. But my friend, you have a lot to prove here. We're going to see with these ratings, your report card is going to come in, and here's my prediction. In three months, you'll have fired your talent booker. I said to Piers before, I said, the first week is great. You've had Oprah, you have me, you have some interesting people. Well, what's going to happen three months from now when you're interviewing Scott Baio? I mean, where, really, what are you going to do? Who's going to care? I want to play you a clip. All because right, play you, a clip. you said this on your show that, uh, in the last few days. They want to announce that I'm going to do this show, but... I don't, you know what? It is Piers Morgan. F*** it. When, when is he starting? I don't know. 
I don't know what the big secret is. Who gives a shit? No one's watching that thing anyway. Well, you, uh, it's not on. That's what I mean. It, it, it might as well not be on. It has as many viewers now as you I mean, wait, Piers Morgan's coming. Woohoo! Listen, I want you to be successful. Are you going to apologize? No, I want you to be successful. I you really do. You don't want me to be successful. I do. No, I you like don't. you. I like no, no, you. can like me, but I don't believe you want me to be successful. I genuinely... Because if they're all talking about me, they won't be talking about no, you. No, I don't see it that way at all. I think, that, I think that I have a very nice career and that my career will always be here. I've seen them all come and go. <laughs> And, uh, I, you know, I, I really, truly want you to be successful. I hope you do well. What's, I think... the, what's the secret? I mean, you're, you're the master of this. What is the secret of being a long-time successful entertainer in America, do you think? I think you have to have a sense of yourself. I think you really have to understand what people want to hear. And, and, and by saying that, I think that's something, not that you're born with, but it's cultivated. Mm -hmm. I had a father and mother who would cut me off the second I went too long. If I started to talk, they'd say, you're boring. You're boring everybody. This is a horrible story. Well, and then, point. But then when I got it right, when I would do an impression of their friends and I had the whole room laughing, it was terrible pressure on me. This is the way I won love and acceptance from my parents. But it was the best training ground in the world. In a sense, I've always been doing a radio show to get approval. It's funny. So I, I stuck out on Twitter today. Give me a killer question for Howard today. Right. And one of them stuck out to me. It was quite a good point. Is that if you've got the, the, the money that you've made, the success you've enjoyed, the status, everything that comes with it, what would motivate you to get out of bed at 3.34 every day and I don't carry know. on doing this? I don't know. I, had, I, I, had had to, I, I came to a conclusion because my contract was up a few months ago. Mm. And I really thought I was going to retire. I said, why am I doing this anymore? I've proven everything I need to prove. My, my uh, show has been successful. I went to Satellite. We started with 600,000 people there. Now we're over 20 million. I feel like we hit a home run, and when I say we, I don't mean the royal we, I mean the whole show, Robin and Fred and Gary, all the people I work with. And so I said to myself, Whaley, why am I doing this anymore? It makes me crazy. I hate getting up early in the morning, and I don't particularly like doing the show. I, I, it, I am driven by a neurotic compulsion to do that show, and it doesn't seem enjoyable. I go home every night and I go, I didn't get it right. I didn't do a good job. I did a horrible job. The show was horrible today. How I, much of that comes from that early experience with your parents? Because I, I read about you watching your father, you know, praising people that he really respected and you craving that praise. Yes. And you've already touched on that. So it was obviously a key part of your early life was this, this need to please your parents. Do you still feel that? Do they still listen to the show? I think it, my, my parents listen every day. I don't think my father listened to me growing up. When I say listen to me, I don't think we had a relationship where he sat and said, oh, how are you doing, son? What is happening? The thing I used to see my father do when we were driving into the city, sometimes I, he would take me to work with him, and my father was a radio engineer. And he, um, he would turn on that radio, and he would shush me. Shh. And my father had such reverence for people with a microphone that it, it, it stopped me in my tracks. It's all I wanted. I wanted my father to hear me. And how often does he say to you, great show, Howard? Uh, rarely. He, he said to me some years ago, um, and this really moved me. He said, um, you're a genius. And I, I was rocked because I never thought I'd hear those words. I didn't think that uh, I was ever going to earn that respect in my father's eyes. What had you done to earn it, do you think? Was there a particular I, I think it was after my movie. It was after, uh, you know, d many accomplishments. And I think in many ways with my career, I was searching for that approval from my father. And it's, it's a very empty search, actually, because when you get it, it's almost too late. It's like, oh, you mean, you mean this is what this was all about, you know, <laughs> this is what it was all for. But, but if, if that has been your struggle, to earn your father's approval, and he finally says, Howard, you're a genius, and many people would agree with him, when you reach that pinnacle, again, I come back to what, what left, what, what's the drive now? Once your dad's called you a genius, you've had all the success of money, I'm curious as to what makes you, Howard Stone, at 4 o'clock in the morning, when everyone else is asleep, say, I'm getting out of bed and I'm going back into battle on this show that often drives me crazy. I'm not you know, even sure I enjoy it. I think it's my identity. I think uh, it's, uh, it's my ego. It's, it's also something that... Insecurity? I, I, oh, absolutely. And but, I, but about what? 
about losing your your place in America. You know, like this is who I am. This is what I do. There's no better feeling to me when I walk in someplace and they go, "Oh my God, did you hear what Camille Grammer said on your show today?" She she was sort of implying that Kelsey Grammer likes to dress like a woman. I go. I feel like I hit a home run, like I'm Babe Ruth. You know, I, I did a great show, or I made people laugh. But more importantly, I, I think for me, and I, and I should admit this at some point to myself, that I actually really enjoy it, as much as it drives me crazy. And my career has driven me crazy. I was so neurotic about my career. I was talking about this on the radio the other day, that when I was in Detroit, it was 1980, and I, I only wanted to succeed. I went to Detroit. There were four rock stations there. We were the bottom of the barrel. We, we didn't have a one rating at this radio station. And the station was horrible and a horrible location. Everything was bad about it. And I was alone in Detroit. My wife hadn't moved there in the time. And I was living in a hotel. I would tape my show. I'd go back to the hotel, listen to the show. And then I would sit in the room. I wouldn't leave it. I never socialized. I never went out to dinner. I would sit and wait for the next show. I, w I, I was insane. I would wait and think about the next show. I only wanted to be successful on the radio. And not being successful in Detroit tore me apart. I became uh, distraught, really, because I put so much energy into it. And then I just sort of had an epiphany, and I said, I think I know what I need to do now. I've worked this out. I went to Washington, and the show took off and was very successful. And one of the things that I knew I needed in the show was someone to play off who was really great with me, and that was Robin. I got lucky and got her. So, um, you know, this career has been neurotic, you know, in, in what I've put into it and what I've really tried to cultivate with it, and I've well, really put you, a lot of energy Talking about the things you've cultivated involve yeah. lots of energy. We're going to take a little break, and when we come back, Howard, I want to talk to you about the three things that I believe you care about most. Sex, sex, and sex. You are a sexy man. <laughs> What's going on with you? <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, this is the greatest. Whoa, everything's coming off. <laughs> Howard, nobody knows what's going on here. All right, well, well now, the girl uh -oh. with the black hair, Maria. Oh, uh, I think a bra has come off. The super grand bra just came off. And it's on his head. Now, Howard, the, the significance of that moment in broadcasting history is it was 1984, and that was the first naked woman you brought into your studio. Well, think about how absurd that is. I remember... I mean, naked women on the radio had. It's, it's like taking it was silly. A, a camel to an oasis and he can't drink. Right. It was silly. And, and what was silly about it was I was at NBC at the time. And NBC, management hated me. They wanted to get rid of me. They were actively plotting to get rid of me. They, they, they just wanted to do it in a way that they didn't have to pay me the rest of my life. So when I went there, it was a, it was a real battle. The whole career has been a battle. But it occurred to me that to have a naked woman on the radio would be outrageous mm -hmm. and yet really who would it offend it's all theater of the mind you don't even really know if she's naked or not but i wanted to see a naked woman and of course someone wanted to come well, down it's all right for you but i remember going to your show and there you are looking at these naked women having a great time but it was crazy tormenting your your listeners who were listening to you watching a woman taking her clothes off but that that wasn't what it was about for me interviewing somebody who's naked to me the fascinating thing was that somebody in the audience had that need to be naked. And, and people have said our show was the, rea was the introduction of reality television. Because really, what I was saying is, it's not about her being naked. It's that somebody even would want to come down to my studio and be naked and be seen in this way. There has to be something more to it. It has to be, why the hell are you down here in the first place? And what do your parents think of this? And, w and what's going on anyway? But no, I liked it. You know, I, I had many bits where I was um, hands-on, you know, of for many years. Did. But I, I'm older and wiser now. Are you, are you sex mad? I'm fascinated by sex. I'm fascinated by the fact that it's so taboo. I found it fascinating that the government would go after me when you had, you know, when we saw every day that priests were molesting young boys and all of this stuff, and you see all of the scandals in our, in our world and the wars, and the one thing in our country that everyone was freaking out about was this Howard Stern and that he had sex, talking about sex on the radio. And, and to me, I, I always thought the most interesting sort of edgy radio was pissing everyone off. And this pissed people off. Sex. Oh, my God, he's talking about When I was sex. at school, so I ridiculous. Remember, it may be just be a British thing, but when I was at school, the guys talking about it the most 
were getting it the least. That's why they were so obsessed. And I wasn't getting it at all. <laughs> so I was thrilled. All of a sudden, I'm a guy. I never got a lot of attention from women. All of a sudden, you know, I started to get popular. I was on the radio. People wanted to take their clothing off in front of me. This is really true. I, um, I went out with a bunch of friends one night for dinner. And they were shocked. We went to dinner. Now, I'm not on the radio. I'm, I'm out to dinner. And uh, three women came up to our table and said, Howard, would you like to see our breasts? And my friends are sitting there like, you know, this, like, and I'm thinking, okay, this is not a big deal to me. And there they, they, right in the restaurant, they pulled their top down. The restaurant asked them to stop. We walked outside. All my friends came, and these women wanted to show me their breasts. Oh, what did you say to them when you, when you examined I said, them? The, well, I said, they're beautiful. And you know what? It, 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 is that it's so just... stupid, the whole thing. I mean, it's well, breasts. Well, then what happens? It's nothing. Nothing happened. I mean, we, so we, three women my friends were standing thrilled. in the restaurant with naked breasts out. Yeah. You're saying they're beautiful. Right. And that was the, it. the normal process. They were there with their boyfriends. They, it wasn't, what? It, they were there with their boyfriends. It wasn't a sexual thing for them. It was like they just wanted to show it to me. How did the boyfriends feel? Um, they seemed to be proud to show. What? With yeah. my wife. Listen, when I, I used to you in a restaurant I, I used to do appearances. Said, Howard, look at my breasts. I'd be absolutely horrified. I would do appearances at record stores, and, and uh, I was hawking a record early in my career and this was the amazing power of radio and what I was doing I walk in and this beautiful woman comes up to me with her boyfriend and says um th the boyfriend and he's a tough looking biker kind of guy he goes Howard do you want my girlfriend <laughs> I said what do you mean he goes he goes do you want to have sex with my girlfriend he says you're the only guy who would allow this you know and, and of course I was married at the time I was in, I, but, but I was fascinated so, so what, you said yes or no but um the answer was no for mm -hmm. me but I, I I never I never cheated so it was like the kind of thing you where you cheated no no, I don't. You've always been faithful. I've been faithful, yeah. Really? Yeah. So that's, Why that's, are you shocked by that? Well, it's the kind of contradiction. See, unlike most celebrities who preach this sort of squeaky clean um, persona about themselves to right. propagate a false brand and then go home and take loads of drugs and sleep around, yeah, you're, the, you're the complete opposite. Right. You talk this great game about wild nights out and strippers and drugs and all this kind of thing. And then you go home and actually you're a domesticated little pussycat, aren't Yeah, you? no, I don't like to go out, I don't like to leave the house, I like to stay home. But I'm fascinated by human behavior. And I love, uh, much like what you're doing here, I love, I love talking to people and I love getting to the bottom of things. I had Ron Howard on the show today and like, you know, we spent 10 minutes on the fact that um, Don Knotts was a ladies' man and I only wanted to know the size of his penis. <laughs> I'm not gay, but I thought it would be interesting to know if Don Knotts had a big well, penis. I thing. have an odd curiosity. Yeah, but you've always maintained, and I, I think I quote directly, that you're hung like a raisin. I am. Yeah, but I'm assuming that's the normal Howard reverse psychology. In other words, if you're always saying you're hung like a raisin, what you really mean is, I'm hung like a donkey. No, well, what I really mean is I'm hung like a raisin. And it's been a source of great embarrassment yeah, But are you me. really? Yeah, I am. I would show you, but I'm embarrassed. So you, you would laugh at it. Would you say physically impaired? No, listen, I'll, I'll tell you what. You, you want to really get into this? I don't know I do, how yeah. much of this you can air because, uh, you know, CNN's a little uptight. But uh, Let's try it. When I'm aroused, I'm, a, I'm, I'm what they'd call average. I'm six inches. How, to, how, mm. how many inches are you? I'm not getting into You've that. You've never measured? No, I'm interviewing you, Howard. Right. Well, I'm It's done about that. your measurements. Okay. Have you ever taken Viagra? Never. Never tried never. it? I don't need it. I no? am, I'm 57 and I am, uh, I am fully aroused. Never, ever so, taken I'm any, aroused now. Have you ever taken any drug? Oh, yeah. I've, I've, had, I've had a history with drugs. I, I never was a drug addict, I don't think. I don't think you'd classify me as one. But I experimented a lot when I was younger and I think I was very unhappy. And I've told my audience over and over again that um, I, I had a terrible experience that I wrote about in my book with LSD when I was young. And I didn't understand. There's no, there's no direction on the, on the acid that you buy. And I bought a four-way hit and I took the whole thing. And I really almost lost my mind. It was, it was the most horrible, worst experience of my life. And I've been a big advocate of saying on the air, I'm for the total legalization of drugs. I think that uh, it's ridiculous to try to monitor that. Even but, though you went through that kind of experience. But I, for myself, I do not uh, as a, as a I father, do, do, drugs. do you actually believe in legalizing drugs as a father? I do. Would you like your kids to have free access to legal drugs? I, 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 think, that if my, I think my kids are very strong. They have their heads together. Yeah, but your kids are lucky that if they're strong. A lot of kids aren't. They aren't. But I think that almost the, um, the illegal factor makes it more enchanting. It did for me. I thought it was sort of cool, you know, mm -hmm. sort of taboo. Oh, I'm going into this this world that's, uh, you know, off limits to adults and, and had all these fantasies about it. That quite frankly, there are so many people hopped up on regular drugs out there, pharmaceutical drugs, 
that it hardly makes a difference at this point. Everyone's high on something. So I, I, I think a show like mine is actually healthy because when kids do listen to it, I can say to them, you know what, this so didn't work for me. Here's why. I tried it, and I almost lost my mind doing it. I'm going to come back in a moment, Howard, with the only drug you seem to really delight in partaking in these days, which is the drug of love with your wife. I'm, I'm in love with you. Marriage and you're romance. A, you're a sexy man. Ever since you After fixed your hair. <laughs> Is this supposed to be some kind of in-depth profile I don't know. revealing you in ways you've never been revealed before? I, I doubt he's going to get that because <laughs> first he goes, can I interview you at your house? No. Can I talk to Beth? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> She'll talk to me. How do I want to show you a charming picture? Good. Of a happily married couple. Where do I there see is, that? Oh. They're in your beautiful wife, Beth. That is my wedding. Yes. What are your thoughts when you look at that picture? Well, Beth is my best friend. And, uh, you know, honestly, I am having a blast in my marriage. I am so happily married. I, I adore her. I mean, I, I, this is my wedding ring. I put a B. <laughs> On my finger. Now that's real marriage. Yeah, but what happens when you just have a dopey ring? But how the reason? Where is my, your wife? The reason my wife's not here, luckily, oh, yeah. I didn't let her knee. But, <laughs> but the, the problem with having a B tattooed on your finger right. is you have to remain married now to B for the rest of your life. Well, or what have she, this lasered off. If I get divorced, you just say, "Oh, that was for bitch," because <laughs> my marriage was a bitch. You know, there's always some way you can creatively work around that. Well, Are you nervous about three months down the road? And, no, you know, I'm not. You you're, should be. You're okay. Okay. You should be. I'm not. Listen, I'm not. King nervous. of all media is a big title. It's like being, you know, like being Muhammad Ali. Eventually, someone comes along and knocks you out. Well, it hasn't happened in I don't even know how long I've been at this. Thirty yeah, years. But, you so. know, you're no spring chicken now. <laughs> hey, I'm getting older. That is true. <laughs> I'm hoping to get out before anybody you, knocks me over. Are you worried, Howard? About what? Well, well, halfway through this interview, it's going pretty well. I'm teasing stuff out of you. You're thinking, hey, hang on a sec, this could be a problem. No, I don't. I don't, I don't think you got anything out of me. What really? did you get out of me? Wait and see. What, did I have a small penis? Everybody knew that. <laughs> come on, come on, peers, let's go. Open me up, baby. What, um, what else do you want to know? Can I get out of here? Hey, let me promote something. I just want to mention that I am on Sirius Satellite Radio, and our show now is on the Sirius app. Mm -hmm. People were complaining. They couldn't carry us with, you know. How with much them. was your new five-year deal worth? Well, listen, you know I've never released financial details, although I read in the paper how much I'm worth every day, and uh, they've never had it right. Uh, they said I had to take a pay cut. I never took a pay cut. You didn't? Crucially? No, I never took a pay cut. I adjusted my hours. Uh, you I do, do more or less? I'm doing. I'm going to be doing less hours. So less hours for the same money, or more I'm money? Not, I'm not. I'm not saying how much money. They've asked me not to. Are say you getting that. more or less than the last deal, as a salary? Um, I would say uh, it's about the same. I would say it's about the same. Maybe a little more. A little more for a little less work. That's right. It's a better deal for you. A better deal. And also notice that when the when you announced the deal, the stock price went up by twenty percent. Presumably you've got stock. Well, listen, I, uh, yeah, I do have stock. So you made another skin full of cash. No, no, I haven't. No, the stock, the stock hasn't made enough money for me to make any cash. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping a lot of people go out and buy that stock, and we can all make some cash, but who knows? You was know. it true the first deal, because we can talk about that one now, obviously the second deal sure. is, is uh, confidential, but the first deal, it was rumored to be $500 million. Well, what happened was that there was a lot of speculation. I never went out and said how much money I was making. But at the time, it occurred to me that I did not want to be on regular radio anymore, so-called terrestrial mm. radio. The FCC was pounding me. I didn't feel like the show was funny anymore because they were editing it like crazy. So they were restricting you too much with the fines that were they, going. They were, they were driving me insane. And when I, I had always been sort of keeping my eye on the technology and satellite radio, and this looked like my way out. Mm. And they said, well, it would be just great if you came over. And, yeah, it was, it cost money for me to come over. But was I will that, tell you this, as much money as they paid me, mm. I paid every dime back and then some. No, no, no one's disputing that everyone else right. gets, gets a rate too. I'm curious why someone so open as you is reticent, and especially since you're a bit of a show-off. Because I'm and very uncomfortable. like knowing how great you no, are. No, I'm very uncomfortable with money. Are you? Yeah, I'm very uncomfortable about talking about it. I, I, I think that... Uh, you don't dispute being worth hundreds of millions, maybe even a billion dollars. Are you worth a billion? No, no. no? I'm, I'm not worth anywhere near what they print in the paper. Are you worth a quarter of an Oprah? Oprah is worth way more money than <laughs> I am. And, you know, Does that annoy you? Uh, um, yeah. That the queen of all media is worth more than you? I mean, Oprah, Oprah was in syndication, and she took chances, and I admire that. I do admire that about Oprah. 
Um, I don't know why. It somehow bothers me that her career has been based on taking Phil Donahue's format and uh, doing a retread. But that's okay. She's brilliant at it, and people love her. And she deserves every penny she has. You know, performers deserve to be paid if they have the audience. And listen, nobody's doing charity here. I, J Jay Leno I, said about you when you made that call to move off terrestrial radio. Yeah. He, he had a bit of a pop at you saying, well, now you don't really hear about how it's done. And that was a big mistake to come Jay, off mainstream. Jay, Jay is insane, and Jay is a crook, and the whole world knows exactly what he's up to. He steals a tremendous amount of material. He's not fit to scrub David Letterman's feet. I don't know why he's beaten David Letterman in the ratings. It's beyond my comprehension. America must be filled with morons who, at night, lay in bed the ones who are watching him, they must be in a coma. What did you think of what he did to Conan O'Brien? And as far he did a terrible thing to Conan O'Brien. I mean, wasn't we, it just business, really? No, it wasn't business at all. It, it, it's a, such a complicated. Did you ever read Bill Carter's book on it? Read sure. that and then figure it out for yourself. Yeah, but what, what is your as a professional entertainer? Isn't it Laura of the Jungle? I mean, if your ratings aren't doing great, and of course, someone but, else comes along. But he had made a certain guarantees to Conan. So this is your show. If, if I was Jay Leno, I would have manned up. I would have said, listen, Conan, you think you're so good? I'm going to go to Fox Network or I'm going to go to ABC and I'm going to put my show on and I'm going to kick your ass. That's what a man does. You don't sort of weasel your way back in by saying, I'm going to do 11.30. Did Conan have a problem with that? Conan said, yeah, I do have a problem with that. Didn't matter. Jay took it anyway. Jay how would you feel? You're number one in, in what you do. Yeah. How would you have felt? I don't like Jay personally. I, Jay, no, was, I one of the the Jay was one of the greatest stand-up comics, in my opinion, when he was younger. But I do not like how he's behaved with me personally. I've done his show many times in the past. I won't do it again. And you know what? I've let go of all of that, even though I'm ranting and raving like a lunatic for your show. Mm. And as far as Oprah goes, I'm happy that Oprah makes a living. When Who people do you most admire in your business? Well, uh, I, Letterman being one of them. I like Jimmy Kimmel a lot. Why, why Letterman? What, what makes him to you the Because standard? Letterman's an original. Letterman came on there. He was a breath of fresh air. He, he was able to do new types of bits, even the, way, even the format of his show, even the way he'd do his monologue, walk to his, his desk, but you wouldn't see him walk to his desk. Everything has been imitated now. He would shoot a thing at the camera. Now everybody shoots a thing at the camera. There were things that Dave did that were very, um, that were very innovative. And so I believe he's an original. I see when Dave does something, the other guys have to follow. So, you know, I admire him greatly. We need a break now. I think we both need a break now. Well, I, I need, need a break. <laughs> I need a break from you, Piers. I know. We I've need to have a little break. When is this show going off the air? Uh, probably the moment this show fin finishes. Right, right. <laughs> I think this is it. This is Piers Morgan Tonight. Piers Morgan Show, starring Piers Morgan. <laughs> now, Howard, I was told that one of the reasons why you're a little bit late arriving in the studio today was the, the hair issue. That we had gel, we had pomade, whatever that is, we had spray... There was a kind of flotilla of people around you. No, actually... Perfecting this beautifully crafted bouffant. This, this look is very, very complicated. Listen, I am not a handsome man, as we can see. So in order to look... Rugged. To look... I'm a rugged man. So in order to, to put this look together, in order to get the appropriate look, it takes hours because... Is it real, that hair? The hair is real, and I, and I, I don't... And I don't, I, color, and I don't color... Don't get too frisky. I mean, if I was to give it a good yank, it wouldn't all just... No, no, it wouldn't all fall out. No, I have my own hair. And you dye it, obviously. I do not color it. As you can see, what? I have some gray in it, but no, I'm very blessed. My, my Howard, grandfather... Look me in the eye and repeat that. I swear on a stack of Bibles that I don't color my hair. Really? Yeah. No. So you're 57, and you have a naturally pretty dark, yeah. curly... A, a big buffant, as yes. they call it. Yes, I'm very lucky. Do you feel... Does it make you feel virile? I am virile, I am. Are you, are you romantic? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, I think what I've learned after all these years, and I'm in therapy, you know, and that's really helped me. In fact, that's where I was before I came to see you. And one of <laughs> the things... The as well. I think I've learned that, my, that uh, you know, it can't all be about me all the time. <laughs> and that in order to have a successful marriage, somehow I have to learn to also make it about my wife and, and to put her first 
and to try to uh, address what she's saying and listen to her and hear. And I think I, I think I'm being a good husband. Every, I'm trying very every hard. woman I I had talked to about you was curious about the same thing. Given your your on-air brand, just ask Howard: Is he good in bed? Well, you know, I that's a tough one. Some women have said yes. Some women How have said yes. How many have said no? Uh, well, you know, listen. Here's the sad part. Before you become famous, is the real test of how you are in bed. I had women cry. I had women... <laughs> no, wait, wait, wait. Uh, with, with happiness or with no, despair? No, despair. In fact, I, the first time I did it, uh, the woman said, I really think this is a bad idea. She said, you know why? She said, um, I know that for a guy, you're always going to remember the first woman you made love to. And I don't want to be stuck in your head all those years. <laughs> so it was, not, it was not a good start. But as time went on, you know, I, you know I, God bless the porno industry. I learned from watching these pornos. I don't know. You watch porno? Well, look, I was going to ask you about this. You bang on about the glory of porno a lot. And yet, again, I come back to the fact you're now a family guy. You've got kids. No, of course not. They're going to no. be exposed Listen, to all this stuff. What's your real view? Uh, my real view is this, that uh, it's, a, it's a sad day when I, I interview many porno stars. And I'm fascinated by their lives because I say, you know, the, the parents must be like out of their minds and and you get all kinds of strange reactions you get my parents are my best friends they support me in the business then you get the opposite reaction I come from a, a very religious family and then you get this other kind of wacky answer and that's what I'm after I think that's what's interesting about the show mm. sitting and interviewing another naked porno star would not be interesting the show would have been off the air do you ever feel uh, I'm gonna play you a clip of the the David Arquette moment which is sure. obviously the stuff of legend and we'll just come back after that and ask you, I want to ask you one thing when you watch this afterwards, whether you ever feel guilty when this kind of thing happens spontaneously. Sure. We get a, a trial separation. We have agreements with it. She knows she's not f***ing me, and she's like, listen, I want you to be able to, you know, do whatever you have to do. You know, essentially uh, free to see people. I mean, listen, from a journalistic point of view, fantastic. You know, this major star rings up and he pours his heart out. He's clearly under the influence of alcohol and it's, it's riveting radio. But when you actually go home and you think about it, are you proud of that kind of moment or do you feel uneasy? Um, first of all, David is a friend of mine mm. and has been on my show many times. So that was the history. That's why he felt comfortable calling in. He's, he's actually spent a whole day on the show. He just kind of hangs out with us. And I like David very much, and I'm really uh, upset for him because he really is hurting about his wife. I don't think he'd mind me saying that. But, you know, um, there's a part of me that went home that day and said, gee, I hope this doesn't backfire on David. But I just kind of get caught up in the fact that I was genuinely interested in what was going on in his life. But you do sometimes wonder, gee, what is going to be the implication? But David is a grown man. I, David was not intoxicated when he did that interview. He was just bummed out and he was upset. But he was not intoxicated. Right. And I think he was saying something really beautiful. He came on because there were reports in the newspaper that were saying that David was cheating on his wife. And that's what broke things up. People picked up what he said there and blew it up to make it look kind of ugly. And he became the cheating husband again. It completely backfired. Mm -hmm. But his intent was good. And to answer your question, no, I didn't feel guilty. So as his friend, though, when it backfires, did you feel uneasy about I, that? I wrote him an email immediately. I said, I don't like what's going on here. I'm getting uh, upset about it. And he said, I'm not. I feel comfortable in what I said. And uh, I checked in on him as a friend to see if he was OK about it. Um, listen, when you're doing a radio show and you invite people on, anything I've said here today, Jay Leno might be upset by what I said today. I'm willing to accept responsibility. I'm not going to blame you. Do you feel bad that, I, that you had me on your show and I no. just said, yep, yeah, of course not. The more outrageous, not. the better. Right. I mean, why not? And uh, David felt most comfortable talking to me, and that's what I'm proud of. And I'm also proud of the fact that I'm the type of broadcaster where when you come on my show, people tell me they forget they're on the radio. And to me, that's um, a good sign. I'm doing something right. So, uh, you know, no, I don't feel guilty about what I do. I, I'm proud of what I do. We'll take another break now, Howard. When we come back, I want to know what you think about the state of America and about Barack Obama. Okay. You're watching Piers Morgan Tonight. About 15 years ago, Howard, you, you nearly ran, or you did start to run as governor of New York, and then you, then you didn't take it any further. A lot of people say to me, Howard Stern would be a real maverick 
politician. I wish he would stand again at some high level. I would be an awful politician because I polarize so many people. I mean, there's a lot of people out there who just, you know, whatever their impressions are of me, I would not be good. But the odd thing about running for governor was it was, it was something where I just got on the air and said, I'm going to run for governor. I'm going to get a really good lieutenant governor. I'm going to accomplish three things. And after I accomplish those three things, I'll resign and let this real guy run the thing. And it kind of caught on in a weird way. And uh, <clears throat> we were going up in the polls. You meant it as a bit of a joke, right? I mean, well, the, the a joke, and yet I started serious. to believe it. I got, exactly. I won the um, uh, nomination of the Libertarian Party, and that was crazy. I mean, that's a whole show in itself, what went on there. And, and actually, it was real politics. I had to win the uh, nomination, got it. We were about 28% in the polls. It was a three-way race between myself at the time, Governor Cuomo, Pataki, and myself. And I was going up in the polls. And I still, to this day, believe I would have won. I think in a three-way race, I would have won. But you pulled out. I pulled out, and I backed Pataki. And uh, Pataki won. Are you, are you tempted to go <laughs> again? No, no, I, I would never. I, I, I can't even understand how anyone does it now. I, I, as I've but matured... When I, but when I hear your show, you see, a lot of it is great fun and great banter yeah. and everything else, But obviously, you're incredibly smart. You have a great quick wit. You have a great sense of what American culture is about, about what real people care about. You said yourself, that's your, your gift, is your instinct for knowing what people care about. These are the credentials for what I would call the modern politician. But you've got to have a love of service. You know, I'm not one of these people who gets on the radio and knocks every senator. I happen to think there are a lot of intelligent senators out there. I hear them speak, and I'm proud to be from this country, and I'm proud of our politicians. There's a lot of good people out there. And I wouldn't run for office, and I'll tell you why, because I'm not serious enough, and I'm not serious enough about helping people. There are too you many... see, I think when I hear you speak like this, I think you are serious enough. You I'm are. serious about the fact that... You're we, always deflected in the end with humor, but actually you are a serious guy. I listen, underneath I, it. I think, listen, when you got guys over in Afghanistan and Iraq, you need some serious people who are going to... I don't want to see guys on endless vacations. I want to see guys working. I want to see politicians taking the job seriously. Bill Clinton was a great president. Why was he a great president? Because he was into the job. This guy was on the job all the time. He loved it. He lived it. He breathed it. And, he, and before he got you in a war, he made sure he thought things through. I was a big backer of Hillary Clinton. I think she would have been the same way. What do you think of, of America right now? What, what do you think it's come to? I think America is the greatest country in the world, and I don't just say that to, you know, to... to I, I love this country. I hate leaving this country. I just went to that Turks and Caicos. I want to go hang myself. <laughs> they have so many ants over there, I was going to throw up. <laughs> I get in my room. I'm, I'm deluged with ants. You should, I was paying a couple of grand a day. To, to be serious, well... I love Americans. I love America. I love our freedom. And nowhere could a guy like me, a, a, a schlub like me, have success with... Where would I get this freedom of speech? They don't allow this anywhere. This show, this show airs the day after Martin Luther King Day. Right. And by sublime irony, really, you now have the most powerful man and woman in America, both being African-American, Barack Obama and Robin, who you created, of course. <laughs> I but didn't create it. But to be, to be yeah. half serious about that, when you first took Robin on, it was controversial, you made a big deal of this. It is actually a very symbolic thing that the president now is Barack Obama, African-American. Listen, I didn't, it's almost uh, ridiculous to say I took Robin on, who happens to be a black woman. Because Some people say, well, did, was that calculated so you'd have a black woman working with you? I couldn't care what color she was. I was desperate. I needed somebody who was fantastic on the radio to work with me, someone who played off me, who had a fabulous laugh, who got my humor, knew when to back off and let me roll, and, and, and knew when to come in and save me. And that was Robin. I never could... In fact, I met Robin over the phone. I didn't even know she was black. A program director put us on and said, let me hear you two guys talk. We started talking. It was effortless. And that's, that's Robin. So this whole idea that, you know, Robin, uh, black woman, you know, some, someone said, it's brilliant. Then you can talk about black people. I go, I'm not that calculated. I needed a real good partner, and Robin's it. When we come back, I want to talk to you about Justin Bieber, Miley Cyrus... And whether I was right to ban Madonna from this show. Okay. This is Piers Morgan Tonight. So, Howard, I, I banned Madonna for life from this show. For reasons I won't bore you with. What's your view of me doing something? Well, I thought that was a particularly good move. First of all, Madonna's never doing your show. <laughs> like most people in show business are not going to do your show. I'm doing it because well, I, you like, I like America's Got Talent. <laughs> I don't even know what this show is. I love that. I love when you hit the buzzer. It's First of all, you're the only good judge. I love Sharon. I've known Sharon for years. 
but she is she does want to be everyone's friend this the guy you got to wonder about is Hasselhoff now that's who you got to get on here well he's actually left America's Got Talent but he's now taken over from me on Britain's Got Talent but Britain's Seriously. Got Talent is nothing and who cares about that I'm <laughs> this guy was Britain's on Britain's Got Talent produced Susan Boyle so you don't you honestly is going to sit here and look me in the eye and tell me you don't know why David Hasselhoff left uh, or you do know no I'm just not going to tell you he left for a personal reason I'm not going to tell you tell me it's not your interview it's not tell your me. damn show how big is your penis Bigger than yours. <laughs> well, big deal. <laughs> Nothing to brag about. But I love you on America's Got Talent. Thank you. What do you think of the current music scene? Uh, you're a DJ, and when you see Miley Cyrus, Justin Bieber dominating, what do you think? I love watching these, uh, like Miley Cyrus, grow up and then start taking all her clothes off. It's very fascinating. <laughs> she didn't even wait till like her 18th birthday, right? <laughs> I like her. I like some. I like Lady Gaga, Miley Cyrus. I don't know. I must. I, I must have weird taste because I like a lot of their songs. I'm actually into some Miley Cyrus. In fact, the other night, this sounds really pervy. I, was just, I typed her name and was looking at her videos. But, uh, Whoa. Yeah, hey, hey, you know, I, I liked it. But um, the current music scene, you know, listen, I, I was a disc jockey for many years. You know, I played records. I hated playing those records. It was insane. I, I, I was neurotic about it. When the records would run out, my hands would shake because I had to get the next record on. <laughs> they wanted the perfect segue. So I hated that aspect of my career. I hated playing records, but I do love music. But I am a real fan of David Bowie. And uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash, The Beatles, like the classic this rock. It's an age thing, do you think? Well, yeah, I think it's part. It's part of you know. Do you worry getting about older. getting old? No, I don't. I'm actually feeling really good. I mean, I don't want. I, I would like to stay like about this age. You know, I'm I'm very happy but right now. Could you now. imagine being 80 and happy? I don't know. It's weird. My parents are in their 80s now, and my mother's like, what the? You know, she says it's re it's really kind of depressing because all of her friends have died, and she's you know she's like, and they're in great health. My parents. Mm -hmm. But what she sees going on around her gets her sad. And, uh, what's, been, what's been the moment in your life which, if you had five minutes to live, you, you would have again? If oh. You, if you could. Well, hmm, you know, it, this sounds corny, but it's the truth. I, I, uh, I adore my children, and, and having my children was an amazing time in my life. Uh, that was pretty spectacular. And, uh, you know, in, in terms of my career, making the film Private Parts mm. was unbelievably satisfying uh, I wrote the book and uh, never expected that it would be made into a movie and lo and behold they bought the movie rights I, I got to work with Ivan Reitman and Betty Thomas and I loved acting and I loved putting that story out there and I feel it's a great accomplishment I liked writing the books I liked the movie so those were real big highlights and also it was the moment you know you said earlier that your father suddenly worked out you know what Howard you've done good actually you, you are a genius you, you, you've I yeah, realized big, yeah, all this hard work has come to fruition. Yeah, that was a big moment for me because my father and I don't have those kinds of conversations. So, does he ever uh, tell you that he loves you? Yes, he does now. He, he didn't, that was something that he wasn't comfortable with. I think my father always loved me, but it wasn't the kind of thing where he'd say, Hey, Howard, I love you. And I would badger him on the radio. I'd call him up, Dad, say you love me. Daddy, say you love me. <laughs> say you love me. And then finally he broke down. And now he says it regularly, and I think it makes him feel good. And, uh, you know, I, I love my parents very much. Now, Pierce, time for another plug. I was um, very uh, <laughs> lax when I plugged Sirius Radio. I forgot to tell you that there's also Howard TV on ah, demand. Thank goodness you mentioned um, it. In the end, you are just a shameless little plugger, aren't you? Yeah, hey, that's, what do you think? I'm here for my health? <laughs> Piers, you're a nice guy, but no one wants to sit and talk to you. I mean, I'm doing it for the plug. I want you to get the Sirius XM app, and don't cut this out. One thing about Larry, it was live. Well, you couldn't honest, cut out those plugs. You can have your plug, because I got the tiny raisin. That's right. You got Howard. a lot of it. Oh, that's it? That's it. You're I off. need 10 more minutes of plugs. You're gone. Piers, I wish you a lot of luck. Thank you. I don't believe you, but thank no, you. No, I really do wish you a lot of luck. Management at CNN, they turn on you on a dime. Look at poor Spencer. Okay, thank you, Howard. They're We've had a great evening. Good luck. And Look we at can't poor wait Spencer. to be back here tomorrow with less Howard Stern. All right.